Well, good afternoon, and uh, what a wonderful way here in Washington, D.C. to finish up the week on a Friday at about 3.30. Um, <laughs> someone asked us why we picked Friday afternoon at 3.30, and we said because it's a good, good reason to get out of the Pentagon and, and do something enjoyable. I would just say, first of all, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much uh, for spending time with us. We know how busy you are working on the farm, but I also offer on behalf of your Air and Space Forces Association that we are blessed by the people in this room today. Um, many of you share incredible warrior statesman experience, combat air forces, mobility air forces, space forces experience, cyber experience. And I would offer that as you signed up early in your life to be responsible for the most lethal war fighting capability in the world, you're also throughout your careers held accountable for that capability. So thank you for what you do. And you believe me, your Air Force Association is on your wing. We want to also always thank our sponsors. I displayed here on the board today, there's room for more uh, in my uh, humble ask uh, as being the professional association singularly su focused on supporting our airmen and guardians and their families, dominant air and space forces, and to never forget our heritage. Some 107,000 members today, uh, more than in a decade. And I would offer the secretary and certainly to General Raymond and General Brown, Chief Bass and Chief Toberman, that means your airmen and guardians have pushed the I'm interested button. Uh, <laughs> and they, in the main, certainly enjoy what they, they're doing. And, and we cannot uh, do enough uh, to educate the public and advocate for them. So with that, Mr. Secretary, uh, certainly open remarks over to you. Uh, we've got about uh, an hour here. Uh, we'll uh, go back and forth with Secretary Kendall and me uh, for a while, but leave uh, time at the end for uh, some, some of your own questions. We'll have microphones. Uh, you'll keep the questions in the question category. Identify yourself. Uh, we'll provide opportunities for, for you all to provide Friday afternoon comments. So again, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all. Well, thank you to AFA for hosting the event today and giving me the opportunity. Um, Orville wrote an article recently in which he said that Frank Kendall was in a pickle. Uh, you probably hoped I didn't see that, but I did. And uh, the pickle is, uh, uh, generally speaking, about the competition between current capabilities and future capabilities. And I think Orville's point in his article is we need more current capabilities, which I don't disagree with entirely, but I'm more focused on the future capabilities and getting to those. And if I look at the risk exposure that we have uh, internationally, uh, I see that risk profile increasing over time and not decreasing. And it's driven by, uh, in particular, and anybody who's heard me speak has heard me talk about this, it's China's modernization, military modernization program, and what it portends. And I've been concerned about this for a dozen years now. Uh, I've been working to try to do more about it, I have a great opportunity here with the Department of the Air Force. Um, and a lot of support from my leadership and, and certainly from my team. It's, uh, it's a delight to have such an environment to work in, quite frankly. The, we're making progress. I'll say a little bit about that. Orville has a lot of questions, and I can either talk for a really long time to avoid them or talk <laughs> briefly to go ahead and get through them. And I'm going to do the latter because I think there are good, good lists of things to talk about. Uh, when I came into office, uh, I, I knew pretty well what I was facing in terms of the threat and where it was going and what it was trying to do to defeat the American ability to protect power. And I felt that we were in pretty good shape on our nuclear uh, deterrent, that we were doing the programs necessary to recapitalize that and to, to, to secure that for the future. I knew that space had to go through a transformation to get to a more resilient capability and to deal with the space threats that we have to face. And I knew that the Air Force needed to move to a next generation of capabilities, basically. What I didn't appreciate was how much, how difficult it was going to be to take care of the Air Force that I inherited, uh, the one that I had, that basically what we've been doing for a very long time is trying very hard to meet all of our current requirements uh, while not doing as much as we could have been doing to sustain the institution that we have. So there are some debts to be paid there that I've become more aware of since I came into office. So that pickle is even a little worse than you might have indicated in the article. Um, what I spent my time on in, the, in my first year, roughly, is first learning a lot more about the institution, such as those things, but also starting a body of effort that was focused on what I called operational imperatives. And they are all about our ability to project power and to deter aggression, and if aggression occurs, to defeat it. And that's whether aggression occurs by sea or by land. 
uh, in the Pacific or in Europe. We have had the lesson, I think, of Ukraine in the last few months, which have demonstrated that aggression by major powers against lesser powers does occur. Uh, and it can occur very quickly and very violently. And if we're going to deter that, we have to have the capability to defeat that kind of a thing. It was not a NATO ally that was attacked, so we're dealing with the problem in Ukraine differently than we would have otherwise. Uh, the, the analogous problem, perhaps, in the Pacific is an invasion of Taiwan, but neither Ukraine nor, nor Taiwan represent the only kinds of acts of aggression we might have to do it. Uh, but that's one of the missions that I think we have got to refocus on as a military in general, but in particular the Air Force and Space Forces. And what I did, what I realized several years ago was that China was investing in the means to defeat our ability to project power and to defeat an act of aggression like that. So we, the seven operational imperatives that I created were the guidance that I gave to uh, the Air Force to set off a lot of analytical work on uh, both operational and technological change that would be necessary to, to do certain functions. So very quickly, the list is getting our space order battle right, which is a very broad one, covers a lot of ground. Uh, getting uh, our version of JADC squared, ABMS, Advanced Battle Management Systems right, so that it is focused on operational return on investment and really gave us a combat advantage. Getting the means to acquire targets in the two contexts that I talked about, either a land or a ground, I'm sorry, either a land or a, a maritime invasion, basically. Uh, and then getting the next generation of air dominance right, which will be built around a program that I started uh, when I was in office before called Next Generation Air Dominance which will be more than just a platform, it will be a plan of systems. All of that tends to depend on the resilience of our forward air bases for the whole tactical air part of what the Air Force does. And the Chinese obviously recognize this. They built a lot of conventional and now hypersonic weapons designed, among other things, to attack those bases. So we have to have resilient basing in one form or another. Uh, the Air Force's concept of that is called agile combat employment. It's a good concept but it has to be implemented in a way which is actually operationally effective, which is gonna require some investments, quite frankly. And then there's the long game, the game that's built around the uh, B-21, which will be entering production very soon. So there's a family of systems associated with the B-21 as well. And the last thing on the list is all the things we count upon to go to, go to war. It's all the things we need to use to mobilize the force, to move it to where it needs to be and support it once you get it there. And there are a number of information systems that are included in there and cybersecurity for all of those systems are a very big part of the things we depend upon to go to war, but there are also targets that can be attacked by other means. So we have to think about those as well. So we spent the last several months with these teams working across the Air Force and the Space Force uh, to try to define the things we need to do to, to meet these operational imperatives. And now we're at a point where we're trying to fit those things into our, our our budget for the FY24. We got some things in 23, and I just finished our round of, of uh, posture hearings. We, we, I think we told the Congress, and I'm very sincere about this, that we had a reasonable balance, that we were meeting the needs of combatant commanders today, we were making reasonable investments in our future. Uh, investments like the E-7 wedge tail to replace AWACS, for example. Uh, investments like NGAT itself, investments like the JATA missile. But there's more to come. And uh, I was quite comfortable defending the, the budget that I presented, but I also put a warning note on the table that FY24 is going to require some hard choices. That under any budget I can, act and can reasonably expect, I would, I would expect that there will be difficult choices. Again, it's back to that pickle. You know, do we maintain current capability, keep the deployments that we have, or do we shrink that a little bit in order to get to the future? And I think those are the trade-offs that we're going to have to face. We're just starting that conversation in the Pentagon. Uh, it's going to go on for several months, and as we were last year, we're working under some uncertainty about where the Congress will end up with in 23. If there were one thing I would make a comment about as part of the Congress, or there are two things. One, thank you uh, for what you did last year, what you allowed us to do in terms of divestitures and investments in, the, in, the, in this past year. But also, uh, please support what we're trying to do in 23, and right now that looks pretty good to me, quite frankly. Um, but there's more to come, and we're going to be asking more of you in, in the future. But get get money appropriated for us on time. 
our most precious resource is time, and we cannot get it back if we lose it. And if we have to wait extra months, several months, before we get our budget approved and get the funding we need and know how much funding we're going to get, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. It's much harder for us to plan. It's much harder for us to execute. So looking for support from the Congress from that as we go forward, recognizing that this is an election year. Uh, it may be overly optimistic to expect a budget before the election, but hopefully we'll get one very soon afterwards. And that'll allow us to inform our submission for 24. So that's that's where we are right now. That's the big picture of, of where, where I see things. And I'll turn it over to you for questions. Well, thanks, sir. First of all, I'm pretty humbled that you might read what I write, so thank you. <laughs> and, but, you know, and we know this, and, and we all talk about this. Um, we're blessed, really, to have your experience as our Secretary of the Air Force in a tough fight. And we know in this town, it's a tough fight. Your Air and Space Force Association's mantra theme, really following your own one team, one fight, is to constantly talk about the reality of the threat mm -hmm. as we would, in every way, try to educate the public, mm -hmm. the broadly defined uh, entire electorate constituency, and certainly those elected leaders that we engage with. China's a problem. Uh, Russia is a problem. Um, and you, we know, are about a threat and form, but not just threat and form, but threat and form match the capability requirements as any secretary maybe we've ever had. So, so could you talk for all of us about maybe uh, unclassified, some more compelling realities as you look at the China threat or the Russia threat? Yeah, there are several there that I could mention. Um, Russia, I, for, for several years, I've not regarded Russia as nearly as severe a strategic threat as, as uh, China. You can't ignore the fact that Russia has several thousand nuclear weapons, of course, and a very large military. Um, they just demonstrated the relatively poor capability of that military, I think, to everybody. What they're also demonstrating right now is they try to grind their way through uh, eastern Ukraine. You know, what, what the mass that they can feel can do over time in terms of in a war of attrition, like the one they're fighting now. Uh, and Russia will recover. They, they will learn from their mistakes. They will learn from the things that happened. Uh, they're already making a lot of changes in leadership. And I expect that the Russian military we would face a few years down the road will look much more professional than one that they demonstrated to us in Ukraine in the last few months. Um, to put things in context for you, and I use this number quite a bit, the, the budget request for national security for the United States this year was $773 billion. That is roughly 50% of the entire gross domestic product of Russia. It is 50% of their entire economy. The economy of Europe is about the same size as the economy of the United States. So in terms of strategic potential and resources and capability, Russia is not really that formidable. If you look at China, on the other hand, China's GDP is approaching that of the United States, and their mil our military uh, investment is less than 5% of their GDP. So they're not comparable uh, states in terms of raw power from an economic perspective. Uh, China has had a fairly successful economy, and they've been on growth path for a long time, and they have global ambitions. And they certainly have very strong regional ambitions, which they've been quite clear about. So of the two, I regard China as a greater threat. The uh, two or three things have happened with regard to China that are notable. One of which was in the press last year was their expansion of their nuclear force. Um, that to me is alarming, and I've spoken about this before. China was content for decades to have a relatively small nuclear arsenal, just a few hundred weapons, basically. And now they're moving towards something that's much more comparable to the U.S. and Russia. That's going to put us into a tripartite, uh, multipolar you know, strategic environment we've never had to live in before. And I don't think China has thought through the implications of that from a strategic stability point of view. They have not had the decades of agonizing about that, studying that, analyzing it, trying to develop risk mitigation measures that the U.S. and the Soviet Union had. So, and at this point in time, they're not really willing to talk about those sorts of things. We need to be having those dialogues. So they're, the first thing on my list for China is their nuclear expansion and what that implies. Uh, and that's its journey we're just, just beginning to start. Uh, coupled to that, and maybe even a, a wider concern, is the cultural gap between the U.S. and, and China. There was a cultural gap between the U.S. and the Soviet Union as well. And I lived that for a long time. I spent 20 years in the Cold War. And there were things I believed that Russia was saying that I didn't think they believed. I thought they were lying to us. And I found out after the Cold War ended that they actually did believe those things, even though they were illogical to me. 
I think the potential for that sort of thing with China is much higher. Uh, I, I think their frame of reference is very different than ours. It's more different from ours than, than the Soviet one was. And we're going to have to learn to understand each other much better than we do now, particularly in a world in which we both have large nuclear arsenals, as well as a number of friction points in uh, different, different parts of the globe. On the conventional side, um, China, for some time, has been decades, has been working to defeat our ability to protect power. I, the short version of this is that we're the dominant military power everywhere on the planet until you get within about a thousand miles of China, and then it starts to change. Now, I, I, I don't want to undersell or understate the capabilities the United States have. We are a very formidable military power, and it would be a great mistake for anybody, including China, to try to take the United States on. Uh, we have a lot of capability, and a lot of capability that isn't even very obvious to our potential opponents that we can bring to bear. And we have a very well-trained, very professional military, very unlike the one that we just saw demonstrated in, in Russia. So uh, I'm not suggesting that we're at any kind of grave risk right now, but I am concerned about these developments and what they pretend, what China's intentions are, and how they might convince themselves, again, that cultural divide, that the U.S. wouldn't intervene when, in fact, we might very well do so. What they have done in terms of modernization fundamentally is learn from our uh, capabilities we demonstrated in the first Gulf War. Long-range precision weapons, uh, they're emulating us to some degree in areas uh, like stealth, for example. They certainly understand network forces and their potential, and they certainly understand the utility of space. More importantly, they have figured out what we depend upon to project power. And on that list are a relatively small number of high-value targets, aircraft carriers, forward air bases and satellites, as well as command and control nodes and logistics nodes. And they have built a large arsenal of precision munitions, conventional precision munitions, both ballistic and crews to attack those assets. It's quite obvious their intent there. And they're doing that to intimidate us, and if necessary, they believe to try to make it uh, very difficult for us to project power. They're also doing hypersonics, and they've demonstrated some fairly sophisticated capabilities, such as uh, the test, the, the orbital test they did last year. Um, so we have a strategic competitor who has a lot of resources to invest and who is very focused on defeating our ability to protect power conventionally into his part of the world, which they see as their part of the world. And so the mission that, that we have, and it falls very heavily on the Space Force and the Air Force, but you can argue the Navy as well, maybe a little less so the Army, although there are important roles for the Army to play in this fight as well. Um, uh, and modernizing to stay at pace with that. And one of my reasons for coming back into government is uh, related to my age, basically. Um, I spent 20 years worrying about a strategic competitor who was well-resourced and very, very determined to have the capability to defeat us conventionally and match us uh, strategically. So I know what it's like. I know what it's like to get up every day wondering what that guy did yesterday and what he's going to do tomorrow. We have lost that institutional memory, I think, to a large extent. Very few, I talked to even my most senior leaders, spent the first couple of years of their career in the Cold War, and everything else has been either presumed American dominance or uh, counterinsurgency campaigns. So we have got to reorient ourselves and develop a sense of urgency about outthinking, outspending, uh, outsmarting a very capable adversary. And as I watched China's uh, various investments, I am frankly impressed by the breadth of what they're doing. I'm impressed by uh, the way they're being creative and innovative in their operational concepts and how they're coming after us, potentially. Uh, and, 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 and I'm impressed by their willingness to learn and get the best from us, but also go beyond that. And their freedom from cultural constraints, which I think in some cases hamper what we would like to do. Yes, sir. You know, so there's a lot uh, of dialogue that goes back and forth between capability versus capacity. Um, when I left uh, Europe after about a five-year tour of a couple of commands uh, in NATO, and I went to the Pacific and spent a lot of time there, as I today, and that's dated information, but today, as you talk to General Wilsbach, and congratulations to General Scorch Hecker, Hecker and Terry yeah, for uh, Scorch's yeah. confirmation today. When those two talk, they're really fighting, talking about fighting one or two wars at the same time with much the same assets, the shifting, the ability to shift mm -hmm. assets from PACAF to USAFE or USAFE to PACAF. So if you look at the capacity and capabilities in the context of two theaters mm -hmm. uh, and two component commanders, uh, USAFE and PACAF, um, 
Should there be a, a more expanded DOD perspective on where uh, we, where investment uh, can provide the most difference uh, and the most decisive combat capability? Well, well, I think you're very right about the ability of some of our forces to swing the theater theater. Yes, sir. That's a very valuable asset for us. And the, the Air Force represents that. The Space Force is continuously in all the theaters, basically. So we have some attributes to bring to the, the equation that are really important for that leader of those fights. I think it's quite frankly unrealistic to think that we can have a force in being that will fight two major wars simultaneously. Right. And I don't know if any nation has ever been able to do that, particularly for a long-term period in peacetime. Um, we do have global responsibilities and we're, we're accustomed to providing forces around the world to do a lot of things simultaneously. Um, under integrated deterrence, we, what we want to do, I think, in part, is take more advantage strategically of our friends and partners around the world and the whole, all the things that contribute to, to power, not just military power. So I think we need to rethink some of that, quite frankly. Um, and and I, I think it's unrealistic also to have a peacetime force that is ready to fight a prolonged conventional war. And I think when we're dealing with major nuclear powers, the prospect of a long conventional war is, is fraught with risk. So what we really want to have the capability to do is to deter and defeat aggression when it occurs. Because wars start by somebody making a miscalculation that they can grab something quickly and get away with it. We've got lots of examples of that, including Ukraine. So uh, that's really where I think we ought to be focused. Uh, that deterrence equation is complicated. It involves a, a lot of different elements. Uh, forward presence is definitely a big part of it. But I think we got to think carefully about the balance. And we've got to do it in a way which maintains a healthy force while we're doing it, as well as keeps pace with the technological competition. Now, for almost 30 years, we, we have not felt that we were in a technological competition. We, we were so dominant in the first Gulf War. And then we went off and thought, you know, a very specialized threat. Counterinsurgencies are their own kind of campaign. And we encountered threats like IEDs, improvised explosive devices, which, you know, we had to react to. And we, we spent a ton of money trying to protect our people from those devices. And we bought a ton of uh, permissive environment ISR programs like MQ-9, for example. Uh, the high-end threats that we face now, those are really not the kind of capabilities we need. So we've got to appreciate, first of all, what kind of capabilities do we need to stay ahead against somebody who's investing very smartly to try to stay ahead of us. We're in a race for technological superiority, there's no doubt about it. And we got to think ahead and we got to move quickly. You know, to steep, take you around, to have the Air Force's accelerate, change, or lose is exactly about this. You know, my, my one team, one flight, and, you know, change is hard, losing is unacceptable, is it, about exactly the same thing. So we have got to reorient ourselves to that. And one of the things I think I bring to the table, again, is that Cold War experience where I remember viscerally what it's like to have a competitor who's actively trying to beat you. That institutional um, awareness, I don't, I think we've lost to a certain extent. And I've, I've said a number of times, if there's one thing I would, I would like to have uh, as a legacy, it's recreating a sense of urgency across the department, across the whole national security apparatus, basically. Uh, but particularly for me right now in the Department of the Air Force. So during the time, uh, we've pretty much been in the Cold War together, obviously different yeah. levels, yeah, but a couple as, of you, guys. <laughs> as, as you've traveled um, and really talked to our airmen and guardians, mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of um, a plan to build on their opportunities to be more ready to train? And that's yep. parts and that's flying hours and that's uh, mm -hmm. exercises. My guess is that you're thinking all the time about balancing capability and capacity mm -hmm. with training opportunities, because as you've said many times, our secret sauce is, is certainly our airmen and guardians. And oh, by the way, the asymmetric friendships they have with their, their allied counterparts. Absolutely. So if you might talk a little bit about how you see and what you're doing to build upon the opportunities for readiness, strictly in the context of training opportunities, uh, and, and obviously other readiness. There are several things. Yeah. Um, it's, again, it's part of the risk balance equation over time and how we, how we address that. Uh, a, a great historical advantage from the United States, again, going back to the Cold War, is the sophistication of our training and the amount that we give our people. Right. Unfortunately, that's eroded to some extent, uh, frankly, more than I'm comfortable with. But it, we're still way ahead of a lot of our competitors. The Chinese are working hard to catch up in that regard. Uh, they appreciate the value of that. 
and from the intelligence I've seen that they're they're working to do something about it. We just saw very very visibly the the the, the lack of training on the Russian side and what not having that type of training uh, can do for the effectiveness of force. The the Russian Air Force has been absent from the war to a large extent, right? Uh, and it's because they've been uh, intimidated by the mostly the ground-based air defenses that the, the Ukrainians have been able to use tactically pretty successfully. And it's largely a lack of training on their part. It's a combination of things, but training is a really big piece of it. Right. So are there, is there, you see a plan for more flying hours, uh, more training hours? Up there? I'd like to get there. I'm going to hold the line uh, absolutely, and I'm trying to get to more flying hours. It's going to be hard. Okay. Um, We've all just seen Top Gun recently. Um, not all, so but I am not. But, even yeah. more excitement I, about NGAD and what I think is defined in your posture statement as the core platform. But you're an expert and you could help us all, I think, talking about the family of systems. What does that sure. really mean? Crude and uncrewed integration. Um, and there's gonna be, you're gonna be asked, I'm gonna ask you, when do we get to see the core platform uh, as defined <laughs> in the posture statement? But, but please, NGAD as uh, Secretary Frank Kimmel would describe it for a few minutes. I got to go out and see my children not too long ago. It was kind of a cool thing to do. Um, I started the Air Dominance Initiative, uh, the Aerospace Innovation Initiative, a couple of years before I left office. And it was a classified program to build X planes to take us to the next generation of air dominance technology. Uh, and I think it was announced in the last administration that we actually have built some airplanes. So I'm not letting out any out of the bag there, but they're experimental airplanes. Uh, but they're a pretty successful program. And they're the basis for the NGAD platform. They were going forward with now. Um, I, I, on Top Gun, I can't resist saying that CQ Brown went to see it and uh, came back and told me he'd seen it. And, and I asked him how it was. And he said, I'm going to go see it again. <laughs> and I said, you just convinced me to go see it. <laughs> so for whatever that's worth, that's a useful piece of information for some of you, maybe. How many people have seen it? Yeah, a lot. OK, I just crowd, of course. I'm embarrassed now that I have it. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I lost the train of the question. Of all that. Well, the, the family of systems, you know, yeah, when, yeah, I, I, when I, Grant Schroeder, Air Superior 2030, he talked about a system of systems. And obviously, it's hard for people to get their brains around how you're going to integrate sure. crude and uncrewed. And oh, by the way, not lightning bolts, but real complex to pull it yeah. all together. Um, there are going to be some developments. But the thing that I've observed based on programs like the uh, ACES program at DARPA, the Loyal Women program that Australia is doing, the Sky, Skybird program that the uh, Department of Air Force is doing is that, and, and, and other things, I've had a lot of conversations with industry too, is that that technology for autonomy has moved forward significantly. And it's largely about software. It's about certain specific forms of artificial intelligence. But uh, you can see a path to real operational capability there, at least entry level, what I would call entry level capability. So how does that actually manifest itself operationally? The concept we have is that uh, you would have a man platform. It could be an F-35 or an NGAD. And that platform, the, the person in that platform is controlling normally just say one to five, just to think of it as a few uh, uncrewed aircraft that are unmanned and that are autonomous, that that person controls essentially as a formation. And to think of it as a play caller or a quarterback. And whatever information that comes into that family of systems which includes the sensors that may be distributed among those platforms, the weapons that may be distributed among those platforms, uh, whatever capabilities, right, tailored to the mission and in a modular way that, that then can operate together tactically. And you have an interesting virtue with that, with that kind of a formation in that you're willing to put at high risk some elements of it because you, you don't have people in them. And that opens up a suite of tactics that today would be unthinkable, basically. Uh, there, and this is going to happen. I have no doubt this is going to happen. And somebody's going to get there first and somebody's not. I want to be first. So I'm gambling to a certain extent that we can develop the platform that would the autonomous uncrewed aircraft that would, would be in this formation. And as we're doing that, continue to develop the autonomous capabilities that would, would host, which will already be software. I'm not going to say anything, you know, that, that you know isn't true about software. It's hard. But nevertheless, I think we can get to a meaningful level of initial capability. And then we'll build on that. And we'll have a foundation on which to build. But if I don't do that platform, we'll do the other pieces, and then we won't have anything to put it on.
So that's basically what we're going to do. I think it's a, uh, uh, it'll be an exciting thing to, to watch mature over the next few years. And I'm not doing this as an experiment. I'm doing it as a real program. We, we've done an awful lot of experimentation and prototyping and virtual things and so on over the last few years. I'm all about real capability. I'm all about getting meaningful capability in the hands of warfighters as quickly as I can. And I think we're going to we're going to on a path that heads towards that as fast as possible with this concept. So both the NGAP platform itself and the associated uncrewed combat aircraft uh, and the mix of things, you know, that, that, that will comprise that formation. There's a suite of sensors, there's a suite of weapons, there's connectivity between them, there's connectivity to the weapons, there's offboard support from other art assets that might provide targeting and situational awareness information to that operator who's trying to control this formation. That operator will need a lot of help, uh, art, you know, auto automated help to do his job effectively, but I think it's going to be a very powerful concept. Yes, sir. It actually leads into the next question. Um, I think your mantra, one team, one fight, probably bothers the Chinese because it brings in our space capabilities yep. ever more integrated All of our joint with our kinetic capabilities. Yep. And so um, as you've talked a lot about AMTI and GMTI coming from space, could you talk a little bit more about really our guardians and our airmen working together? I've offered over and over every guardian, every airman a warrior. Mm -hmm. And this whole notion of, the Space Force or the Air Force enabling joint combat operations. Just me, these guys, these guys and girls, Airmen and Guardians lead combat operations with most the most mm -hmm. lethality in the fight. Mm -hmm. And so the Space Force, the Guardians are from the kill chain. Uh, so as they as they target. So I just uh, offer that to you. And thank you, by the way. Uh, we're on your wing on one team, one fight. So. Great. Thank you. Uh, it's broader than that. It really encompasses the entire joint force and encompasses our allies. Sure. Um, the um, it's been very interesting for me to come back and have a Space Force and an Air Force in the department. And uh, you know, I've got great leadership team, Jay Raymond, uh, my undersecretary, Gene Ortiz Jones, and CQ Brown are our senior leadership team for the for the department. We meet every day for half an hour first thing in the day. It's our best meeting of the day. We all feel that way about it uh, to make sure we're entirely aligned and we bounce ideas off of each other and, and figure out where we're going to go together. Um, the Space Force is just about, I think, to graduate its first class of people who didn't transition over from the Air Force. So, and they're trying to build their own culture, which I fully support, and trying to make sure that uh, both the Air Staff and the Secretary give them some space to go, you know, be unique in their own way that they want to do. But they're a member of the team. And I, I gave a speech at the Space Symposium where I concluded with something I wasn't sure they all wanted to hear because they're kind of excited about the fact that, that they're going to go fight for space basically um and the point i made was you are the enabler for the joint force and you are the protector of the joint force if you can't provide services to the joint force that give it the situation awareness the comms the missile warning all the things that they need uh the joint force will fail and if you can't protect the joint force from targeting from space by our adversaries the joint force will fail and your role on the team is essential to our success so i made that point pretty clearly i thought uh, Jay Raymond is in 100% agreement with that. We're working our way through a space strategic review right now that I can't say a great deal about, but it's going to be largely about how space contributes to the joint fight, and the combined fight as well. Right? So all of this has got to be knitted together. We're one of the artifacts of what the Chinese are doing is the threat they pose to our high value aircraft, AWACS, J-STARS, even E-7 that we're acquiring. Uh, we've got to do some of the jobs that we would have done from those kinds of platforms from space together with some airborne assets to make it a harder problem for the adversary. Uh, so providing that kind of capability is a critical part of what they do for the team as well. Nobody fights alone. Yes, sir. Um, moving into then uh, your some of your points on agile combat employment, and that kind of goes along with the tyranny of distance across Indo-PACOM. Yeah. Do you have the military uh, mobility aircraft uh, forces you need, the combination, obviously, of C-1s, C-17s, KC-46s coming along, and obviously C-130s. Um, do you see that as about where you need to be or a limitation to make a ACE real, I guess, is the question? Um, making ACE real is going to be a combination of things that we're going to have to do. Uh, it's absolutely the right thing to do, but we're going to have to invest in it enough to make it operationally capable uh, against a threat that's definitely trying to target our air bases. Uh, I can't say enough uh, in praise of our mobility uh, part of the Air Force. What we did in Afghanistan you know, last summer was just amazing. And the way people managed to keep all those C-17s and other aircraft operational 
uh, was really, you know, inspiring. And they don't, I think they got, in all the criticism about how you know Afghanistan uh, fell faster than anybody expected it to, the the operational uh, success that they had in the Vietnam combat evacuation was amazing. They did a fantastic job. Uh, you mentioned Jackie; she did a terrific job earlier. She did a terrific job there. Um, I'm generally comfortable with that fleet. I'm generally comfortable with where the tanker fleet is. We're continuing with KC-46. We're going to see what the next tanker after that will look like, and then continue to modernize and recapitalize there. Um, I am starting to become a little bit more concerned about what the Chinese in particular are doing in the area of long range engagement to try to get at some of those assets at the ranges at which they wanna do things like refueling. Yeah. Uh, and to get at some of those things that are, you know, bringing longer range missiles and using far and command and control. It's not the first thing on my list to worry about, but I think in some future round, we're gonna be spending a lot more time trying to figure out how to keep those assets viable against the threat that they're gonna face. Sure. But that's where it to come. Right now, I'm reasonably happy with where those elements of the ports are. There's a couple of combat commanders that are very watchful of everything that Airmen and Guardians and certainly our Secretary of the Air Force brings to the fight. U.S. STRATCOM, uh, Admiral mm -hmm. Richard, mm -hmm. and of course, U.S. NORTHCOM, General Van Herc. Yep. Talking to General Van Herc the other day, he would tell you that, uh, and I don't mind saying this, he and, and Admiral Richard are joined at the hip in the defense of the of the homeland, STRATCOM mm -hmm. and NORTHCOM. Absolutely. So could you talk a little bit about um, supporting how, uh, in your organized training and equip role, leading our Airmen and Guardians role, uh, how you look at support, certainly for STRATCOM, but as that would sort of merge or integrate with, with NORTHCOM also? Um, there's a relationship there, obviously, right? yeah. the defense side of uh, that duality. Uh, good relationships with both were probably our highest priority is recapitalizing the nuclear triad. Sure. And of course, the Air Force has two legs of that. Uh, all those programs, I, I, I never say a program is doing great and on track because all programs can get in trouble, and most do. Um, and the further along you are, as you get out of the design phase and into the building phase, the more likely you are to see problems that are much more visible. Uh, but B-21's moving forward uh, reasonably well. NGAD is earlier, Sentinel now is at earlier stages of development as further to go. Uh, but at this point in time is, 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 is doing well. So we're fully funding those. We're also doing uh, things in the Space Force on the nuclear warning and the missile warning side to get to more resilient missile warning to support those forces, as well as uh, strategic communications. We have, to, we have to move forward with replacements for command and control aircraft. And, and that's that's coming along as right. well. So I think that portfolio overall in terms of modernization and recapitalization is in pretty good shape. Uh, Continental Air Defense, um, we're buying some F-15EXs to contribute to that fight. There's some other things we might be able to do that are more cost effective than that that would help as well. They, um, uh, we're doing some things to upgrade our early warning capability right. uh, over, the, over the horizon radar, for example. Yeah. Right? So uh, we're, we're mindful of those missions that if you look at, what we said, I think, about our national defense strategy, you know, nuclear strategy, nuclear deterrence is first, homeland defense comes next, and then other missions after that. Yeah, sure. So we're, we're very aware of and focused on those. Sure. Well, we'll go to questions in just a minute, but before we do, um, you know, you've traveled in Ellis a number of times, and you've mm -hmm. become more and more familiar, and I'm sure provided vectors for our red flag exercises or weapon school exercises. A lot of people don't understand the force mix that happens out there yeah. every day. Yeah. Uh, Every AFSC uh, represents bomber, fighter, missile, airlift, uh, certainly space, intel. Mm -hmm. um, as you look at the force mix there with the combat air forces that you see today and, and going forward, uh, one of the questions obviously comes up, how many combat air force squadrons do we need? But, but beyond that question, um, could you talk a little bit about how sometimes we look at singular platforms, the one plus one equals six mix and, and combat effectiveness get when you, you integrate F-15EXs mm -hmm. with F-35s, with F-16s, with, you know, B-2s and now soon B-21s. So just a perspective on that as you would go again from threat and form requirements to uh, sort of a vision of the future, I guess. Uh, you make a good point. Alone and unafraid is not the way we're going to fight. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, we have to fight as a integrated force. Yes, sir. Uh, one team, one fight. Yep. And that definitely involves uh, a mix of wide area surveillance capabilities, situational awareness, and target tracking right. and handover, right. battle management capabilities, uh, as well as a lot of individual platforms that have to work together as, as a team, yes, sir. Uh, supported by space assets that are another source of information and awareness for the team. 
And I think a strength of the American military, what we did not see with the Russians right, recently, is the ability to integrate that force and make it work together. This has been an evolution that's been going on for a very long time. You probably remember airland battle, sure. right? And the follow-on forces attack, you know, suite of capabilities that also fought as a right. team. So again, we're back in a high-end fight yeah. against a real competitor, and we've got to be able to get as much as we can out of all the assets that we have. So designing for the integrated force, not just the individual pieces, is really the way you have to approach that. Yes. Would you go so far as to say, I think there's numbers out there from 50 to 60 combat air forces squadrons. Is there a number out there in your mind or do you use that? I tend to shy away from that. Um, I, I am, I, I, I'm, I'm forced by the position we're in to go to the Congress and say, we've got to divest right. to invest. So I'm gonna, we're gonna have to continue that path. Um, it's for me the critical thing is to get to the next generation capability as quickly as we can because the, the current generation is serving us well it will continue to do that for some time uh some of our, our average aircraft is 30 years old and we have some aircraft that are not tailored to the high-end fight at all um you know the people who man and operate those aircraft do a fantastic job i'm very proud of them but we're going to have to get to the next generation and I've been taking a threat briefing, classified briefing around the Hill to everybody who listen to it, but I've basically been to all of our committees. I did the uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus yesterday uh, to try to make people understand the need for modernization and the, and what the threat is, is trying to do to us. Um, I, I remember very well my confirmation hearing when Senator Reid chairing the committee said he wanted to have a conversation about strategy and I never got a question about strategy, I got, 30 or 40 questions about my C-130s and my MQ-9s and my A-10s, right? Um, trying to make it clear that, that the consensus we once had during the Cold War, again, a memory from long ago, uh, we all understood that national security was important and people were willing to make investments and to look past sometimes their near-term political, political interest. Uh, we need to get back to that. So there's an education process that you can help with yes, sir, to help people understand that. Uh, and I was really heartened in one committee meeting where the chair of the committee uh, looked across the aisle and said, okay, guys, we have to work together to solve this problem. We got to stop being so parochial and so narrow-minded. So we need a lot more of that to get to where we need to be. That's, that's leadership. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Well, let's uh, go to uh, time for questions here, about 15 minutes or so. And uh, we'll start with John Turpak. Very good, thank you. John Turpak, Air Force Magazine. I uh, wanted to ask you about NGAD. Uh, Dr. Roper, the previous service acquisition executive, sketched that out as we would do a new one every five years, build 50 to 100, and move on to the next one. You recently said that uh, we're into the EMD phase with the first one. Uh, but you also said that you'd started this program back in 2015. So is this now the second iteration? Can you can you say, are, are we sticking yeah. with that model of every five years, 50 to 100? What, what is your thinking about uh, the, the pattern, the timetable? I think we have to do a mix of things on a mix of time frames. The, 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 the program we were talking about uh, started in 2014 or so. I put it in a budget 2015. We got it on contract in late 15, if I remember right. It was for X planes. It was for technology demonstrators. It was not for operational aircraft. And uh, we did that in a reasonable time frame for that kind of a program. The NGAD that we're working on now, uh, which is a lot more funding and is going to take longer, is a more complicated operational air manned aircraft. It's a follow on to F 22. It's not a simple design, it's designed to integrate an awful lot of requirements. The uncrewed combat aircraft that I'm talking about, on the other hand, I intend to have uh, uh, the concept is to have a more modular design, much less expensive. Uh, not all the systems that a, a manned aircraft needs to have to support the operator, uh, just those things we need for whatever mission we're asking it to do. For those kinds of platforms, I think we can do a much quicker refresh technologically. And I think we should, okay? So that, that's a, a different kind of a design. It's much harder to do that for something that has the complexity and the uh, and the and the and the set of requirements that something like an F twenty two or an F thirty five has. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for Will Roper. I've worked with him a lot. Uh, I think he has some really interesting ideas there. But I think you have to be careful where you apply those ideas because at the end of the day, it's all driven by the product. What are you trying to build? If you're trying to build an F thirty five with with everything that that entails to get 
really a whole generation of better capability in a number of different areas. That's a long, hard job uh, to do. If you're trying to build something quick, which does some basic functionality that you can then you modularly insert things in over time, it's a different different animal entirely. I, I, when the first question Lee Ampanetta asked me, I think, when he became Secretary of Defense is, you know, we did MRAPs really quickly and F-35 is taking forever. Why can't we do more things like MRAP? And my answer to him was complexity. Uh, a better answer might have been requirements. It's all about what it is you're trying to do. Sure. Uh, can I follow up real quick? Um, you said that the sure, go ahead, John, and then and then we'll go right over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, the other, the follow-up then is uh, you, you mentioned we're into the EMP phase. Should we conclude that competition for this iteration is concluded, or are you trying to take uh, more contractors? No, I would like when I say EMD phase, well, first of all, it's a classified program, and I can't say much about it. We still have competition. Thanks. Uh, please, right here. Mr. Secretary, Rob Buskin, uh, local national security group and formerly part of the Air Force Secretary. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing up the issue of technological competition. You know, with your background growing up in the research and acquisition for the Department, can you talk a little bit about we were able to assume for decades technological superiority and China's modernization clearly that level of advantage is eroded. Can you talk about if not the department, the Air Force strategy and what concerns you may have in terms of how do we secure uh, more robust and capable industrial base in our basic challenge? The industrial base depends upon uh, what we buy. I mean, and the industrial base, you know. More so in recent decades, I think, is responded to requirements. It tends to, it, as the national base consolidated, um, and as we stretch out the amount of time between acquisitions, there are fewer opportunities. And it's been a long time. I think the only thing recent I think of that's like this is Tektron's attempt to build their own, uh, you know, light attack jet aircraft, basically. Um, so the, the nature of the business environment has changed, and I think defense companies with the high barriers to entry generally for defense products have generally been content to invest modestly and wait for the next RFP. Um, we've done a lot of work to try to bring non-traditional companies into the mix through organizations like DIU and SCO and others and for, for the Air Force. And the problem with that approach is that the, what the DOD buys for the most part is complex weapon systems in relatively small quantities for which we pay small margins. That is not a commercial business model at all. But it's because those products are so unique and because the DOD is such a, uh, doing bits of the DOD on things like that, there's such high barriers to entry. We've sort of got the defense companies that we've got. And there's a supply chain that supports them, right? And that's really where a lot of the issues are. So at the top, uh, I, I think, quite frankly, we overshot and consolidation a little bit, but we're okay. We got competition there pretty well. What's driving the rest of the industrial base is how much we're buying and how frequently we do new designs and so on. The industrial base responds, and it's really hard in the budget to allocate money just to help the industrial base somehow because there are so many things we need to buy, right? So I think what, what we're going to do is... Uh, in my case, is that CQ Brown and I, in particular, this applies to Jay Raymond's as well. I think to some degree, we're going to be looking hard at all of our prototyping, early development programs, to try to decide which ones we're really seriously interested in. And we're going to build a bridge across the value of debt for those. Others we may stop because even if they're successful, there's a very low likelihood we're going to procure them because of budget constraints. So we we've got to actively act, act, actively manage the defense industrial base. I've got two acquisition executives. I've got a space acquisition executive, Frank Calvelli and Andrew Hunter for everything else. Um, spent a lot of time with them talking about this. I'm trying hard not to do my old job and my new job, uh, but very aware of the industrial base and trying to think open-mindedly and creatively about ways to keep it strong. But I think at the end of the day, it's it's about what we spend on what, and uh, you know again I I'm I'm more focused on getting that mix right from the point of view of modernization of the Air Force and keeping an eye on the industrial base and trying to do some things that don't do harm there, uh, and and ensure that we have what we need than anything else. So that's the big picture, as far as I as far as I see it. Yeah. Right over here on the left, please. Simmons with the Roosevelt Group. Thank you very much for uh, coming back into service. Thank you. There hasn't been a sense of urgency for several years now. Um, 
not this security agreement allows for high level cooperation with Australia and the UK. Is the Air Force planning to leverage that to put any resources toward it? Now we have close relationships with both. I'm very interested in expanding competitions with both. I've, I've talked to some of the people involved in AUKUS and proposed that we do more under AUKUS, but we, we do a lot anyway with, with both of those countries. Uh, so I, I think one of our great strategic strengths is our alliances, not just from the point of view of military capabilities, but also from the, the shared uh, values and in particular, the shared technological capabilities. Yeah, I, I mentioned the Australian Royal Wingman earlier. I think that's a very interesting program, which has a lot of interesting applicability. Uh, the UK is doing some things in propulsion, for example, and other areas that are very interesting. And they've done some things in on, on crewed aircraft as well. So I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Uh, Japan's another partner who's expanded its willingness to do things with us and very important power in the Pacific as of South Korea. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there, uh, but our closest partners, clearly Australia and the UK and very open. And we, we share a lot of very sensitive material with both of them. So it's just a good opportunity there. Please, right here, please. Secretary Kevin Logan with Google Cloud. Okay. Uh, as we look at the future, I come from a four generations of uh, military service. And we look inside the service and we're seeing a classified security. What's your view on how we can build out the Space Force, address some of the challenges of the Guard, and really sustain the force in all volunteer force for the future? Space Force is relatively small. It's only about 8,500 people right now. It'll get bigger than that, but not dramatically. And there's huge excitement about the Space Force. I'm not terribly worried about recruiting. I think they're doing a really good job on that. Um, the, the, uh, the advances that are happening in commercial space provide a real opportunity for us on several levels. And I've just had a lot of chance to interact with some of the commercial space companies. Um, they, we can buy their services. And we got to think about what the business model is to do that. We can emulate some of their uh, techniques for fueling space-based systems that are very different than the historical DOD techniques. Uh, and we can work with them cooperatively in a number of areas, right? So I think there are a lot of things that can be done to take advantage of what's happening in commercial space. It's really quite exciting. Um, and I think the defense companies are kind of waking up to what's happening there. Some of them are involved in it. And uh, I, 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 what, what, what my observation, I guess, I'll put it this way, is that what some of the commercial space companies have done is because of their proliferated architectures and their business model have thrown out the design book for satellites that the DOD uses historically. And they're, they're doing good enough instead of exquisite. And they're not building things they expect the last 15 years that do every function you can cram onto a very expensive platform. They're doing things that they expect to last a relatively short period of time and be replaced. Uh, and, and in which there will be a lot of capability distributed more than, than, than concentrated. Uh, and that's really exciting to see. Um, the Space Development Agency, which will become part of the Air Force in a few months, has really exploited that with their early architectures for space communications. Uh, we're going to try to exploit that for the missile warning architecture that the Space Force has already you know, put on, underway. So there's a lot of something there. The interesting, I also noticed that the Google guy is the only guy who's appropriately dressed for the weather. Uh, good for you. <laughs> I wish I dressed like that too. Well done. <laughs> exactly. You can all weather. learn something from the commercial world. Right here in the front row, please. Mr. Secretary, uh, Chris Methvin, I just joined uh, Dell Technologies after yeah. uh, 20 years uh, acquisition. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for reading the paper uh, that all the PMs wrote for you. Uh, in 2015, it was yep. amazing to get a response back uh, with all those insights. Um, what I've noticed since joining Dell is that there's a lot of um, technologies that are available uh, in the commercial sector that are lagging and, and uh, have yeah. a long time to get to federal. Is there any way that we can potentially speed up that process and bring those things in? I, what you need to, what we need to collectively speed that process, I think more than anything else, is smart customers. People who appreciate that and uh, this is a training and education process for the government, fundamentally. My kind of seminal experience in that regard was with the Defense Digital Services Group. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this group, but it was a group of, uh, it was modeled on something that was done for the federal government largely. And it, it's, I started interacting with them probably in the middle of the second Obama term. They were formed after uh, the ACA was passed and we rolled it out and did not have a great success with the initial rollout. And they're what we called at the time, post-economic people. 
who had made so much money in some startup somewhere that they didn't really care about money anymore. And they were happy to come work for the government. They were actually employees. And they came in and worked uh, for a government salary doing software related things, generally speaking. So the Defense Digital Services uh, team had come on board and I had a couple of problem programs. I won't mention them because I might embarrass somebody in the room. I had a couple of problem programs that were very software intensive. So I said, you guys go out and just live with these guys, with the industry and the government team, and give me your assessment of how we're doing relative to commercial best practices. And they initially came back and said, these, you know, these are good engineers. These guys are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. They're not, they're not bad. And then after a little more time, they came back and said, you know, you're actually five, maybe even longer, five years behind in terms of software development practices from what the commercial world is doing. And part of the reason that, that was true was that what we were imposing on defense contractors was obsolete technologies we thought were cutting edge. And so we, the DevOps came out of that, you know, the, the, the defense world suddenly discovered DevOps as a result of that experience. And we were way behind on that, right? So I think we're doing better now, but we've got, the point I'm making is that the government side of the equation has got to be cutting edge. We've got to put people out with industry. We do that, but in a modest scale, the Air Force has done a pretty good program there. Um, and then use that expertise and proliferate it throughout. The first job I gave the DDS people when they came back was, okay, we got to train our people. And I need you to put together a plan for a training program to do that. And I think over the few years that I was out of government, a lot happened to kind of move that ball forward, frankly. And we're in a better position than we used to be, but we got to keep at it. It's something you can't just do once and then think you're done because commercial industry doesn't stand still it's, it's for very good reasons, right? I think we have time for one more question. Good afternoon, Reggie Robinson with BAE Systems. Uh, Mr. Secretary, earlier on you talked about JATC2 and the importance of getting that right. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like, getting it right, and then what efforts are ongoing in the Pentagon to kind of align what the Navy's doing, what the Army's doing to make sure that we get that joint effect that we're looking for. And, and last, any thoughts on inflation and what's that just doing for your hard decisions? With Those are before? two very different questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> inflation, I'll do first, it's easier in a way. Well, maybe not, but anyway, um, we are doing on inflation is we're pricing some of it in and we want to work with the Congress to make adjustments as necessary for whatever it actually turns out to be. Mike McCord, all the services were asked to provide their plans for dealing with inflation, basically. Mike McCord, our, our comptroller, undersecretary for financial management for the department, got everybody together and basically wrote back to the, to the committee chair saying, listen, we know there's a, uh, an inflationary pressure right now. We know inflation is occurring at high rates. We don't know what will be in the future. We're going to price it in to a modest extent, two and a half, three percent, something like that, um, uh, which is historically what we've been seeing for a long time. And we're prepared to work with you as we get more information out of the economy and what we're really going to face. We also want to tailor how we manage inflation to what we're actually buying. And so pay for our military people. There's one place you go for that. The services that we acquire and the products that we buy are a different story, right? and the raw materials that we buy are a different story. So we want to tailor our economic adjustments for inflation to what the market's actually doing in those areas, as opposed to more generally. So I, I think we have a reasonable approach to that. We do need the cooperation of the Congress to work with us to make adjustments as, as we go forward. Okay, uh, that was only the first part of your question. Okay, okay. Uh, Gatsby Square, the, the, um, the uh, observation I had from the outside was that we had fallen in love with an idea and hadn't figured out how to actually implement it. And we were out doing a lot of experiments that were kind of some part, we, as if we had imagined a fully decorated Christmas tree and we were buying ornaments randomly. Um, and we hadn't even designed the tree yet and figured out what we we're gonna do. So when I came in, I tried to, the way I wanted to focus our work was you know, show me where it matters. Show me where connecting people and moving information and processing matters to an operational result. And then we'll design around that. Because our product is that we're after here is more efficient forces. So if I take the same number of planes and weapons, for example, I'm gonna apply them to a target set. I wanna get a better result. And I wanna get a better result because of the way I'm using information which is about collecting it, moving it, bringing it someplace, processing it, and making decisions that affect the outcome. 
And I don't think we had thought through that. I don't think, and I think that's still a work in progress. And then I realized as I spent more time with the Air Force that we weren't organized to manage that kind of an activity, that we really need something. We used to have systems commands that were had broad responsibility for functional areas like command control battle management. And we sort of went away from that model after the Cold War ended. So we're in the process of creating what I'll call an integrating program executive officer to manage the various program offices that are building the various ornaments for the Christmas tree and the tree itself. The other thing that I discovered was I didn't just need ornaments, I needed a new tree. That our existing infrastructure was obsolete effectively or approaching that. And we have to go do some modernization on a scale that I had not really appreciated until I came back in and looked at it carefully. So we're organizing to do all that. We're continuing in our budget right now, some of the projects that were you know, going in the right direction uh, and part of the solution, but not all of it. So I'm trying to get my arms around you know, that, that, that entire entity of capabilities that we call GIC squared, our version being ABMS. And part of it is definitely connecting to the other services, which are both part of the joint fight. Well, thank you, sir. We're uh, winding up the day here. Um, and again, your day, not mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's five o'clock somewhere. I'm just getting started. Yeah. Um, the, uh, we might close out a bit. I would just thank you uh, on behalf, really, of 107,000 members of your Air Force Association. At the same time, hundreds of volunteers. Uh, yeah. We have two board members, at least, in the uh, audience today Kathleen Ferguson, uh, who's joined our board, as well as Joe Burke. And those volunteers uh, are absolutely committed to you and really uh, to many of those in the audience that represent industry, building an ever stronger warfighter and industry team. So thank you so much for thank your you. time together uh, and, and your leadership. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, sir. Good to be with you guys. Thank you.